Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 and find verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> our topic, as we are looking at our fourth message in the Olivet Discourse, is the abomination of desolation. Just those four words are words that would strike fear to any heart. The abomination of desolation. But these are words that Jesus used, and he did not use them lightly. All seriousness, he spoke to the disciples and talked about this. The scripture says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, it goes on uh, because Jesus gives the signs for the impending destruction of Jerusalem in verses 15 through 28 of Matthew chapter 24. The verses leading up to this cover the time between the first persecution of the church under the Jews beginning in about 36 AD until the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Matthew and Mark have a different statement about the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem than does Luke. Luke has Jesus saying, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Matthew and Mark give a more ominous rendering of Jesus' words. Matthew says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So do we have a contradiction between the two versions here? Or are all three of the evangelists reporting the same thing? Well, we shall see in just a moment that there is no contradiction all three are saying the same thing. But Luke does not mention anything about Daniel the prophet. And the reason for that is that uh, his gospel was directed towards the Gentiles to whom the prophecies of Daniel would have had very little meaning. Keep in mind, Matthew and Mark wrote their gospels to the Jews. And certainly since this had not happened yet, I guess. Maybe I have to stop and think when they wrote their Gospels. Anyway, even if it did happen, the fact that Jesus referred to Daniel would mean something to the Jews. Didn't mean anything to the Gentiles so much, but it was important to the Jews. Let us consider then this abomination of desolation to which Jesus refers. Jesus said this abomination of desolation would stand in the holy place. And Mark adds, standing where it ought not. Jesus then makes reference to, the, to Daniel the prophet. And Matthew and Mark insert a parathetic com uh, comment. Let the reader understand. Which implies that we are not to take what Jesus said in an absolute, literal sense. Talking about this abomination of desolation and Daniel the prophet and so forth like that. Uh, it's not clear whether Jesus made that statement, whoever reads, let him understand, or the, the writers actually inserted in that. My opinion, for what it's worth, is that Matthew and Mark both, both inserted that statement in there telling us that we need to go back and look at Daniel, read through his prophecies, and weigh what Jesus said in the light of those prophecies. While Daniel did prophesy of an abomination that happened under Antiochus Epiphanes, there is a more exact meaning that can be discerned through looking at Daniel's prophecies as a whole, and specifically, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Daniel speaks of an abomination of desolation in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, chapter 11, verse 31, 
and chapter 12, verse 11. In the study of those prophecies, we see Antiochus Epiphanes descending, excuse me, desecrating the temple by bringing a statue of Jupiter Olympius into the holy place along with images of other pagan gods and worshiping them there. You will recall when we studied the prophecies of Daniel's that we covered that ground pretty thoroughly. And that was certainly an abomination of desolation. On first impression though, it appears that Jesus is saying that the sign of the imminent destruction would be something similar to what Antiochus did. In other words, you kind of get the idea that the Romans would bring an image of a pagan god into the temple. We know that Jesus lived at the time that uh, Judea was under Roman power. So any army, any force that would come in would naturally be the, uh, the Roman army. And so when you think about this desolation and abomination uh, under uh, Antiochus and take it to the Romans, you see them kind of doing the same thing. Well, being perfectly honest, that did happen. But it happened at the end of the siege of Jerusalem. And by that time, it was too late to be a sign for people to flee from Jerusalem. Because when that happened, Jerusalem had already been overthrown. And Jesus says, he's talking about signs, he said, when you see this abomination of desolation, he says, then flee. Well, if it was the pagan gods being brought into the temple, it was too late to flee because they were all dead. Well, several millions of them were dead. To properly understand what Jesus was saying, as recorded by Matthew and Mark, we must think of what happened to make it possible for Antiochus and eventually the Romans to be able to enter the temple and set up their gods. That which made it possible for them to do that is the actual sign, not them setting up their gods in the temple. Jesus calls this sign the abomination of desolation. So what does that mean? Dr. Albert Barnes in his notes on the New Testament writes, he says, the abomination of desolation. This is a Hebrew expression meaning an abominable or hateful destroyer. The Gentiles were all held in abomination by the Jews. The abomination of desolation means the Roman army and is so explained by Luke chapter 21 verse 20. The Roman army is further called the abomination on account of the images of the emperor and the eagles carried in front of the legions and regarded by the Romans with divine honors. If you've ever seen movies about the, the Roman soldiers, you know, they, they've got these little skirts on and these you know, metal helmets and they've got spears and you know, javelins and things like that. And you always see them marching. And in the front of them, there are these, they're called ensigns, they're, they're flags. And they would be held up on a pole and they would be draping down. Okay, well, those were uh, indications of what legion they were, who the emperor was, what gods they believed were with them and protecting them. And these flags, these ensigns, were almost like gods to these soldiers. Um, you know, they, they didn't necessarily carry little idols with them, but these flags reminded them. Well, we're, we're fighting for Caesar, whichever Caesar it was at that time. And this God, that God is the God of our legion. So the Jews knew that. And the Jews, in spite of lapses into idolatry, but at this time in the history of, of the Jews, they were very strongly against idolatry. And they did not tolerate it at all. And so the Jews looked down upon all Gentiles as pagans and as idol worshipers 
and the Jews held all Gentiles um, apart as an abomination. That's the facts of the time. Dr. Adam Clark expands this explanation a little for us and provides us with a quotation from Josephus, who was actually there during the destruction of Jerusalem. If you've never read uh, Josephus's uh, Wars of the Jews, uh, you ought to read it sometime because uh, he was there. He was a general in the, the uh, Israel, Israel, uh, Jewish army. Uh, and he was also a, a, a historian and he would record things that happened. Very enlightening to, to read what he has to say. Uh, everything that he says is not necessarily to be taken for truth because he had a lot of prejudice because he was a Jew. Some things he was misinformed on, some things he was mistaken about, but for the most part, his history is very accurate and gives you a glimpse into the mindset of the Jewish people at that time. Dr. Clark says, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. This abomination of desolation, St. Luke refers to the Roman army. And this abomination standing in the holy place is the Roman army besieging Jerusalem. This, our Lord says, is what was spoken of by Daniel the prophet in the 9th and 11th chapters of his prophecy. And so let everyone who reads these prophecies understand them, and in reference to this very event, they are understood by the rabbins, that's the Jewish uh, theologians. The Roman army is called an abomination for its ensigns and images, which were so to the Jews. Josephus says the Romans brought their ensigns into the temple and placed them over against the eastern gate and sacrificed to them there. The Roman army is therefore fitly called the abomination, and the abomination which maketh desolate as it was to desolate and lay waste Jerusalem. And this army besieging Jerusalem is called by St. Mark standing where it ought not. That is, as in the text here, the holy place. As not only the city, but a considerable compass of ground about it was deemed holy, and consequently no profane persons should stand on it. So we understand fairly clearly now that the Roman army is this abomination. And this abomination was to bring the desolation of Jerusalem and the holy place where it ought not to be standing is not the holy place in the temple but the ground around the city of Jerusalem <clears throat> to the Jews Jerusalem was sacred because that was where their temple was that's where God dwelt in the temple and for some distance outside the city's walls it was considered to be sacred and holy ground. And they took great offense whenever Gentiles would come within that ground around the city. The expression standing in the holy place at first glance does give the appearance that this abomination would happen within the temple. But there is a more basic and applicable meaning to this expression as Dr. Barnes will tell us, stand in the holy place. Mark says, standing where it ought not, meaning the same thing. All Jerusalem was esteemed holy. The meaning of this is, when you see the Roman armies standing in the holy city, or encamped around the temple, or the Roman ensigns or standards in the temple, jo Josephus further relates, that when the city was taken, the Romans brought their idols into the temple and placed them over the eastern gate and sacrificed to them there. So we do see that the Roman army did do the same thing with the temple as Antiochus Epiphanes did with the Greek army. 
they desecrated the temple by bringing their gods in. But as you see here plainly, this was done after the city was destroyed. And if you know the layout of the temple, it talks about they brought their ensigns to the eastern gate. That was the very front, the main entrance of the temple. The temple was built facing the east. <clears throat> so when you came in, you had to come in to the court from the east. You would come to <coughs> the laver in the brazen altar, then go into the temple proper to the holy place, and then you have the holiest of holiest. So reading and understanding the similarities between the sieges of Jerusalem under Antiochus and later under the Romans, we find the following three things. <coughs> the abomination to which Jesus refers is the Roman army. The desolation is the desolation the Roman army would make of Jerusalem, as did the army of Antiochus several hundred years earlier. And the holy place, or the place where it ought not be, is the environs of the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> the first question asked by Jesus' disciples was, when will these things be? And that is, when will the destruction of Jerusalem take place? Remember, that's, that's the thing that started this whole discourse <clears throat> that Jesus gave to his disciples. Jesus answered the question, telling the disciples that these things will be when Jerusalem is surrounded by the Roman army. Luke puts it in the following words um, that are so plain they cannot be misunderstood. He says, but when you see Jerusalem <clears throat> surrounded by armies, then know, <coughs> excuse me, then know that its desolation is near. Pretty plain, I think I can understand that one. <clears throat> From that point, Jesus gives the disciples some further warnings and instructions in the following verses. <clears throat> Matthew and Mark have essentially the same rendering of what Jesus said. Luke departs just a little bit. <clears throat> The first thing, those in, Jerusalem, those in Judea are to flee into the mountains. <clears throat> Luke includes this instruction. The second thing Jesus says, when you see the army out there, leave immediately. Don't stop to get your belonging, belongings, whether you are home or out at work. Go, go, get out of there, fast. Third, Jesus pronounces a woe. He said, woe to those who are pregnant or nursing babies at this time. And Luke also mentions this woe. You see, these women would not be able to travel as quickly and as far as needed to escape the Romans. So it would not be a good thing to be expecting a baby at this time or to have a small infant that you have to take care of so closely. <clears throat> the fourth thing. He then adds that they should pray their flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. You see, in either of those conditions, there would be no place to take shelter and conditions <clears throat> would be too severe for travel. Fifth, Mark and Luke have Jesus saying, there will be a great tribulation to such a great degree that was never has never been seen, and it would be worse except for the sake of the elect. Luke shortens this comment to, there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Six, he again warns the disciples about false Christ who will produce wonders that could deceive the elect if they are not paying attention to what Jesus now tells them. <clears throat> and the disciples pass this lesson on 
to the church that was born there at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. It was taught to them. And we are told uh, in history that when the Romans besieged Jerusalem, the Christians had already fled. So there were essentially no Christians left in Jerusalem when the siege of Jerusalem took place in 70 AD. <clears throat> and seventh, Mark and, uh, Matthew and Mark close Jesus' comments on the destruction of Jerusalem with a final warning. See, I have told you beforehand. Matthew adds a little tag to what Jesus says by letting them know that this destruction will come on them suddenly and without much warning. <clears throat> And it did. Now, the Jews at this time in 70 AD were in rebellion against Rome. But they did not expect what happened to them. Why? Well, because false Christ did come and say, hey, you'll win. God will defend you. It's okay. Don't worry. And there were millions of Jews in Jerusalem at the time that the Roman army came. And it happened almost overnight. Luke adds something that neither Mark nor Mar uh, Matthew nor Mark records. He says, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Wow. Albert Barnes offers us an explanation for these words. Shall be trodden down by the Gentiles shall be in possession of the Gentiles or be subject to them. The expression also implies that it would be an oppressive subjection as when a captive in war is trodden down under the feet of the conqueror. Anciently, conquerors trod on the necks of those who were subdued by them, trod on their necks. The bondage of Jerusalem has been long and very oppressive. It was for a long time under the dominion of the Romans and then of the Saracens and is now of the Turks. That is the time that Barnes wrote this and is aptly represented by a captive stretched on the ground whose neck is trodden by the foot of the conqueror. And I add, Jerusalem and the Jewish state were in the hands of the Gentile peoples until the United Nations declared Israel to be a sovereign state in 1948. But even today, Jerusalem and much of Israel are still occupied by Gentiles. And these Gentiles are called the Palestinians. So when you hear the news about the Palestinians and the Western Bank and Gaza and stuff like that, they are occupying areas in, Jerus in uh, Israel. And Jerusalem is a divided city. There's a Palestinian part and there is an Israeli part. The Palestinians are Gentiles. For the most part, Palestinians are Arabs. For the most part, that's what their heritage is. The words, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, are actually controversial. Millennialists believe that the times of the Gentiles will last until the second coming of Christ, at which time Jesus will set up the kingdom of God with its headquarters in Jerusalem. That's their perspective on that. <clears throat> Barnes comments on this until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This passage has been understood very differently by different expositors. Some refer it to the time which the Romans who conquered it had dominion over it, as signifying that they should keep possession of it until a part of the pagans should be converted and it should be rebuilt. Thus, it was rebuilt by the emperor Adrian. Others suppose that it refers to the end of the world when all the Gentiles shall be converted and they shall cease to be Gentiles by becoming Christians 
meaning that it should always be desolate. Others that Christ meant to say that in the times of the millennium, when the gospel should sp spread universally, he would reign personally on the earth and that the Jews would return and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. This is the opinion of the Jews and of many Christians. The meaning of the passage clearly is this. First, that Jerusalem would be completely destroyed. Amen. Second, that this would be done by Gentiles, that is, by the Roman armies. Amen. Third, that this desolation would continue as long as God should judge it proper in a fit manner to express his abhorrence of the crimes of the nation, that is, until the times allotted to them by God for this desolation should be accomplished without specifying how long that would be or what would occur to the city after that. It may be rebuilt and inhabited by converted Jews. Such a thing is possible, and the Jews naturally seek that as their home. But whether this be so or not, the time when the Gentiles as such shall have dominion over the city is limited. Like all other cities on the earth, it will yet be brought under the influence of the gospel and will be inhabited by the true friends of God. Pagan, infidel, and a Christian dominion shall cease there, and it will be again a place where God will be worshipped in sincerity, a place even then of peculiar interest from the recollection of the events which have occurred there. How long it is to be before this occurs is known only to him who hath put the times and seasons in his own power. I don't particularly agree with his last statement, but so much of what he said is so very true about the time of the Gentiles there. Jesus made reference to the prophet Daniel with the excitation to read and understand. While this comment can and does refer to the destruction of Jerusalem, such as under Antiochus, there is a more telling prophecy in Daniel that addresses the very things Jesus says about the destruction of Jerusalem. And this prophecy is the prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Those verses say, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, Daniel does not speak of the times of the Gentiles, does not use that phraseology. But he does tell us in this prophecy that he, meaning Messiah, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. He also says that Messiah shall confirm a covenant with many, which covenant is the gospel of salvation from sin, under which both Jews and Gentiles are brought into a right relationship with God through the atonement in Christ. Simply stated, with the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD, the Israelites ceased to be the unique covenant people of God. And that beautiful relationship is now offered to all of humanity, to Jews and Gentiles. So we learn from Jesus that Jerusalem and its temple are to remain trampled by Gentiles until the very end of time. You see, there is no need for a millennium, as salvation is available to all who will receive it through faith. And let me close with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you 
not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. The apostle is quoting from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. And he says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We don't need a millennium. All people, Jews, Gentiles, can be saved if they will humble themselves, place their faith in the atonement of Christ, repent of their sins, and allow the Holy Spirit to cause them to be born again. Amen.